I'm really excited and pleased to be able to introduce Congressman Jared Huffman um, as our first guest for this evening. Um, since 2013, Congressman Huffman has represented California's second congressional district. Um, he currently serves on the House Natural Resources Committee, uh, the Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure, and the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis. Uh, during this Congress, he is co-chair, he's chairing the Natural Resources Subcommittee on Water, Oceans, and Wildlife. Uh, during his four terms in Congress, uh, Congressman Huffman has built a reputation as a progressive leader and an environmental expert who gets things done. He's been a champion for issues that are critically important uh, to members of our community, but also to the United States, um, including religious equality, science-based legislation, and addressing the threat of climate change. In November of 2017, Congressman Huffman publicly identified as a secular humanist and became the only current member of Congress to openly identify as a non-theist. Uh, and in April 2018, seems like it's been, <laughs> it's been a long few years, uh, Representative Huffman co-founded the Congressional Free Thought Caucus, which he currently co-chairs along with Representative Jamie Raskin. Uh, we're incredibly honored to welcome Congressman Jared Huffman. Well, great to be with you, Nick. It's an honor and I'm uh, looking forward to our conversation. Awesome. Well, uh, I, I want to start, you know, in, in I think one of the, the most critical places that so many people in our community um, tell us is, you know, a, a common thread in their, in their journey. And that is the decision to be open and honest about their lack of religious beliefs to their, in their lives, either to their friends, their family, their loved ones, their coworkers. Um, but very rarely when we do it, uh, is it national news? Uh, we don't often have to do that in the Washington Post. Um, how did you decide that it was the right time for you to, 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 to say that, to, be, to make that decision? Yeah. Well, I sort of grew uh, increasingly less coy about the subject uh, as my public service career uh, moved through the years. Uh, I was on the Stephen Colbert show. He had this little uh, segment back when he was uh, the Colbert Report. And uh, he would have members of Congress on and generally humiliate them. And, and the jokes were always on them. Uh, but uh, he uh, zeroed in on the fact that in my congressional profile, when I was asked what my religion was, uh, I declined to answer that. And uh, he asked me if I was an agnostic or an atheist. And I said, perhaps. And, you know, did, did a little bit of ducking, but I wasn't really ducking too much. And that, that was kind of the beginning of my public uh, honesty uh, about the subject. It, it got a little easier in 2017 because my my dear mother, who was very religious until the end of her days, uh, had passed and going ahead and publicly acknowledging my um, non-theism became much easier at that point. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I remember that segment. Uh, I remember it very well. And I, you know, Stephen Colbert is famously Catholic and <laughs> enjoys having that debate, I think, with anybody uh, you know, on his shows. Uh, and I think it's always a interesting spot for people to be put in. And I, I certainly commend you for uh, going on that program and uh, going on that segment. Uh, how was how was the reaction to uh, to your decision from other members of Congress? Were they opposed to it? Were, were your staff just apoplectic? I, you know, I, I know that it's always a difficult yeah. decision, uh, especially for people in public life. Well, I didn't do it lightly. Uh, I consulted with a lot of the people that I trust. Um, to a person, they said, don't do this, by the way. Uh, so there was literally no one uh, urging me to go public as the only openly non-theistic, non-religious member of Congress. Uh, but I was just really tired of, of being coy and, and less than forthcoming on the subject because you, you get asked about it all the time. Um, and, and I do think my constituents are entitled to know what my moral framework is. Does it derive from religion or is it something else? And so I'm, I'm happy to talk about the subject. Um, so I talked to some friends at the American Humanist Association, and uh, uh, it turns out they had sent me a questionnaire. I guess they send it to every member of Congress asking about some of this stuff. And I, um, I normally throw those questionnaires away. Don't ask me why, but I filled this one out and I was very honest and I sent it back. And my phone rang, I think, a few days later. Did you really mean that you believe these things and you would uh, take these positions? And I said, yeah. And so we started talking about uh, whether I'd be willing to publicly identify as a humanist and accept their endorsement. Um, and of course, I, I was happy to do that. And, and then it became a question of how you do it. And I think at one point we were debating between allowing USA Today to have the story 
or um, a more trusted journalist that I knew through other um, friends at the Washington Post. And I went the latter route. I'm really glad because it was a very thoughtful rollout. And uh, I think how you message these things when you're a public person like me really does matter. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I remember that interview. Um, I think it was uh, Michelle Borstein, I think, wrote it. Yeah. Um, and it was just a really great, thoughtful piece, as you said. And, you know, you mentioned that you think it's important that constituents know where you're coming from. And I, I, I do agree. And I think it's one of the things that people struggle with often is, is you know, even folks who claim a religion, um, maybe they're not being completely truthful um, or they're not, you know, they're kind of doing it because they think they have to. Um, what what were the reactions like? Was it mostly positive from your constituents? Overwhelmingly positive. Uh, so as much as everyone had prepared me for this massive backlash uh, and, you know, my friends and uh, family members and others who had my interests at heart, you know, were really worried that that would happen. It, it never came. Uh, what I did get is an awful lot of support. And a lot of people who even are, are religious people that I know and work with, respected the fact yeah. that I was just being honest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, the I, I, the thing that, that you mentioned that I think a lot of us can relate to is that conversation with family members. Um, and and was that a was that a, a sticky one? Was that what was the next Thanksgiving like? I, I remember the article was, I think, early in November of 2017. What was late November yeah. <laughs> around the Thanksgiving table like? Were there were there any questions there? Well, um, you know, most of my closest friends and family members have known where I am for a long time, so nothing had really changed. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it really grudgingly, I think everyone came to accept that this might not have been a bad idea. This this is going to be OK. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that example, the the fact that there wasn't this big blowback sort of shows just how far things have come in a relatively short amount of time. Um, you know, I, I mentioned to some folks that it occurred to me uh, that you're the first sitting member of Congress to speak at one of our conventions, um, and it, like it didn't it didn't seem like a big a big deal when we were talking about it and when you know we were thrilled that you accepted, but it wasn't you know there there wasn't a confetti falling from the ceiling or anything, yeah. but it was would have been unthinkable um, just a few years ago for any member of Congress, I think, to to yeah. speak at one of our events. So um, it's pretty you know, remarkable. And it, it's interesting how much people assume this massive backlash. And, yeah. you know, my brothers, for example, neither of them are religious. They're pretty much like me, yeah. but they, they both said, don't do this. This is crazy. Uh, you right. know, you're going to, you're going to end your political career. So, well, you showed them. And I think, you know, the, the being the first one through the door is is a really big step for a lot of people and it makes it easier for the next one and that's something that i think we talk about a lot is making that a, an easier road to travel for the next person so yeah. um I, I, again I, I really yeah absolutely um i want to move a little bit to um some of the policy stuff um we we american atheists and and with your help and the congressional free thought caucus's help um sponsored a briefing back in 2019 to talk about uh, state legislation, uh, to talk about Project Blitz, to talk about this yeah. uh, Christian nationalist campaign to just assault our state legislatures. Um, and, you know, we were really surprised, I think, that day to see the turnout that we had. We just, we were, had a completely packed room, standing room only, and we were pleasantly surprised by that. Um, but it seemed like kind of the lonely drum we were beating. Um, but now it seems like every news outlet is trying to contextualize Christian nationalism and is pointing out this explicit linkage between that ideology and what happened on January 6th. Um, how have you seen the conversation about the role of religion in public life, especially this mm -hmm. religious extremism changed uh, during your four terms in office? Well, first, thank you for uh, partnering with me and with the Free Thought Caucus on that event. Uh, that was, you're right, the, sort of the early days of people tuning in to Christian nationalism and that agenda. And uh, I, we've come a long way in part because we've seen so much ugliness uh, come out of that agenda. And I think seeing that ugliness, you know, personified by the Trump administration and, uh, you know, what Pompeo did with the Secretary of State's office, um, the, the, the real culmination of all of it on January 6th, where you had 
all of this uh, religious messaging and imagery interwoven with this Trump insurrection, I, I think it just became unavoidable for people. The connection was so obvious. Um, so I think people see it for what it is much more right now uh, than we ever might have imagined even a few years ago. And uh, we've got a lot of momentum to push back against it. And as far as the the legislating that's happening, um, you know, I think that a lot of folks are starting to see it uh, in in some of the the bills that have been introduced by some of your colleagues uh, who are, might be in the minority right now, um, basing a lot of their policy making on this twisted version of religious freedom. Um, but we're we're seeing the pushback to that. We're seeing positive bills. I think for the first time in a long time that that aim to neuter that uh, and and to counteract that um, is. Are people, even religious lawmakers, starting to kind of see the threat here? Or I guess, you know, we, we know that this is happening in the States, that all this this bad stuff is happening. Did, was January 6th, do you think, a, a big wake up call for them? Was was that the, the thing that pushed it over the edge? It wasn't just January 6th. I, I think really it was just this, this entire um, very disingenuous uh, push toward theocracy that we've seen uh, during the Trump years. Even people of faith, if they're good people, if they're decent people, don't want to live in a theocracy. And they saw how craven and corrupt uh, and um, un-American really so much of that was. And so uh, I've been pleased to see you know, colleagues who I know are religious, other people who I know are religious, recognize uh, that religion really was weaponized uh, and and uh, that their faith in some cases was hijacked and uh, cheapened by what we've just lived through. So we have a lot of allies, I think, uh, on, on these issues. Yeah, I, I think some of the most powerful allies we have are the religious folks who, you know, look at what's happened with, the, as you said, the corruption in their mind of, or in their view of, of their faith, groups like Christians Against Christian Nationalism or the Baptist Joint Committee, for example, just to, to name a couple, um, and you know, members of the Free Thought Caucus who are religious or, or who identify as a particular religion as well. I think people recognize that and see that. Um, one of the things that our constituents often ask us about is what they can do that will actually make a difference in policymaking um, as far as protecting secular government, um, promoting good public policy that's based on science and reason and our values. Um, for, for somebody like you, who's a member of the Free Thought Caucus and who is kind of out in front of these issues, um, I, I think your constituents maybe have it easier. Um, the, the questions often come though from the folks who, you know, live in a district where uh, you're represented by someone who is a member of that Christian nationalist insurrection yeah. caucus, we'll, we'll call it. Um, they, they often feel kind of powerless. Um, they don't quite know what to do that can make a difference. So how do you think people can change the conversation or can have the biggest impact, um, particularly in places like that? Well, I would suggest a couple of things. First of all, um, the secular community is really growing up rapidly and uh, coming of age. Um, you know, the demographics have been changing in our favor for some time now, uh, but the politics, uh, that, that part of the change has lagged a little bit, but it, we're catching up. Um, I think the secular community is almost an oxymoron. There's there's nothing to knit us together like like our religious uh, friends. You know, they have their congregations and their faith organizations, and um, we we got to create something like that uh, on the secular side of things. But it, it is really happening. And uh, this last political cycle, I think, was maybe the the greatest example yet of um, the secular vote, the secular movement. Um, coming of age and, and actually being a real serious uh, presence uh, in American politics. So I would say continue to support the organizations that are part of this secular coalition. American Atheist Association is right in there with the humanists and others. And uh, I value that as a member of Congress because um, it's, it's a great set of associations, a great coalition for me to work with, to tap into their expertise and their advocacy. But then I would also say get political. Uh, because it's not enough to just do the wonky work on bills and litigation and other things. Uh, you got to win elections. And uh, if, if we can do both of those things, I, I think the secular community should continue to uh, get stronger uh, as time goes by. 
I think a lot of folks also are just they don't they don't necessarily know how the day to day of Congress works. They don't they don't see it. They don't understand it because it it's kind of a black box sometimes where um, you're not sure how calling or writing or meeting with a member can can change someone's mind. Um, what is is that something that you pay a lot of attention to as a member of Congress? Not necessarily just you in particular, but as an elected official, as a member of Congress, as a member of the House. What can people do that will hopefully move the needle a little bit? Maybe on you know not talking about the again the insurrection caucus, but maybe the folks who are in that middle who just haven't given it a lot of thought or you know don't know the issues very well. What can folks do that that, that would help them get them to yes on on a bill? Well, there's strength in numbers, and to the extent that you can uh, band together uh, through associations and organizations and weigh in on. Uh, pending legislation through petitions and letters and other ways to to try to move the needle of public opinion to show elected officials that we're engaged, we're watching, um, we care about this. That'll matter, I, I think. And uh, you know, getting getting involved on the political side helps too. Um, get, let politicians know that there's a political constituency for the separation of church and state and for defending these these secular values. Once they begin to see that, they'll join the Free Thought Caucus and they'll co-sponsor legislation with me and others. And, uh, you know, it's it's a uh, stimulus response uh, situation here. That's what politics really is. Yeah. You, you know, you you started your career in public interest, in advocacy, kind of like a lot of us do. I, I, I understand that you worked for the Natural Resources Defense Council um, and then decided to kind of take that leap into politics. Um, mm-hmm. What was that decision like for you? Was that a was that a scary <laughs> thing? I know that a lot of people right now in particular yeah. are thinking of running for office. Any advice for those folks? Uh, yeah, I, I will uh, suggest some advice. Uh, you should run if you've got the bug and, and you care enough about these things. Um, I, I think we need more uh, champions of secular values to get out there and run for office. And that too will help move the needle politically. My one suggestion for those who are thinking about that is um, find some issues that you really care about. For me, it was the environment and that work on good environmental policy, protecting fisheries and critters and just my love of nature uh, drew me very naturally into public policy and and eventually politics. And, And by the time I got there, I stood for something. There was some authenticity to who I was and, and what I wanted to do. If you just like politics, uh, there's no shortage of people like that. It's it's that's flim flam. That's that's the Matt Gates kind of uh, you know uh, approach to politics. Uh, just raw ambition and quest for celebrity. We got enough of that. We don't need any more of that. Uh, follow your passions and your values. Stand for something. Care about something. And then I think uh, you'll be more politically successful at the end of the day. Anyway. And you started as well, and in, in, in at the at the local level, um, right? You you yeah, it was like a water board. water board, which was yeah. you know not a not a glamorous twelve years by any right. stretch, but uh, it, it it was good, honest local government service. It was great. Yeah, and that's that's something that I think a lot of people need to hear, even from a member of Congress, is there are all these levels of government that that directly mm-hmm. impact your day to day life. And sometimes that local water board or that local school board or city council is the thing that not only can potentially lead to a career of public service, but can really make a difference in people's lives, either for better or for worse. I mean, that's where we've seen some of the most egregious policies uh, happen, but also some of the best. Yeah. Um, It's also a great way to find out if politics is for you, because, (laughs) uh, you know, you have to work with other people and you have to suffer fools in public meetings and learn some of the basic skills of, of this strange uh, public life. And it's not for everyone. Yeah. Uh, as far as a career in public service and in, in public life, what, what would you say is maybe the biggest uh, disappointment you've had uh, during the time? Because it can be frustrating. It's local government in particular, like you said, you have to suffer fools and it's you, you have this little area that you can work in and that's it sometimes. Um, do you have any like yeah. big disappointments that you look back on? Well, you know, I've had a pretty charmed political life, so I, I, I think it would be um, wouldn't be right to focus on disappointments. I uh, feel a great deal of satisfaction, and uh, I've had a lot of good political fortune. And you know, if you'd asked me a few months ago, 
I, I might have been a little more negative in my assessment of my uh, political life because we'd gone through several years where it was very frustrating and uh, I wasn't uh, hitting the ball out of the park uh, at my at my many opportunities. But um, I guess I'm learning that these windows open where all of a sudden this gusher of productivity can happen. And that's what we're in right now. And it feels pretty uh, exhilarating, quite frankly. I mean, what we're doing in the American Rescue Plan, what we have the opportunity to do with this infrastructure package, what that means for climate and for social justice and equity and so many other things that we've been beating our heads against the wall on for years. This window's open and, and uh, I think we're about to do some really great transformative things. So um, I, I'm in a pretty positive mental space right now about my public service. Well, that's, that's really great to hear. And I, I think that looking at for, you know, for a lot of us, the, the biggest issues, and we did a survey of non-religious folks all across the country, and some of the biggest issues that people communicated to us that they were very concerned about were things like secular public education, uh, protecting public education in general, but also climate change, also, um, you know, LGBT equality and, and the right to choose. Um, it seems like there's some good opportunity here and, and that a lot is getting done at that. Uh, would you like to talk just a little bit about um, maybe what's on the horizon that you that you can talk about uh, for, in, in Congress as far as addressing issues like climate change? I know you're on the, as I mentioned, you're on the select committee for the climate crisis. Is there anything we should be keeping an eye out for? Well, this infrastructure uh, package is the next big thing. And uh, it's gonna be where a lot of the action is for, for a couple of reasons. One, uh, if you've looked at what's been happening to our greenhouse gas emissions during this year of pandemic, it's been a really interesting experiment in, in how far you can go with behavioral change to reduce emissions. It only gets you so far. Uh, so I think most of the most of the analysis is you get between five and seven percent emission reductions. If we're going to hit our targets to keep uh, global warming below two degrees Celsius, 1.5 if possible, um, we got to do a lot better than that starting right now, year after year after year. So uh, the rest of our missions are embedded in our infrastructure. Uh, behavioral change alone will not get you there. And, and that's why this next big thing we're doing is so important. We have a chance to just transform the infrastructure of this country to make it really green, to electrify vehicle fleets and create these backbone uh, charging systems all over the country that will dramatically transform our, our transportation sector, do more on the, the electricity side. Um, just, it, all of it is so great. And it's happening concurrently with uh, new leadership at the State Department and from the White House that has a chance to you know, begin to bring the global community together around these things too. So it's it's a pretty exciting moment. The, the other reason that's probably gonna be where it happens is just our margin is so thin in the Senate. You only get two shots at budget reconciliation you know, per year. Uh, we burned one on the American Rescue Plan, so we got one more uh, and it's probably gonna be infrastructure. So we gotta tackle climate, we gotta lift our economy, we, we've gotta deliver on this infrastructure promise that has been around and nobody's been following through. Everything is aligning on that being just uh, a, a super important and high stakes uh, thing for the next three to four months, I would say. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I wanted to um, give an opportunity for folks to ask questions that they may have. So if folks do have questions, please make sure you ask them in the chat and we will um, get to them in a bit here. Um, I wanted to also just close though, while we're getting ready for that part of things with kind of a lightning round, something a little bit lighter, <laughs> so we don't have to uh, spend all of our time, you know, really digging in on nitty gritty policy things, but can have a little bit of fun here because that's what this event is all about. Um, so I'll start with one that maybe segues a little bit, but uh, if you could snap your fingers and just like fix one thing in government or change one thing about the way government works, what what would be your your wish, your your, your one wish to fix? Oh, wow. Well, <laughs> let me start with an easy one, right? <laughs> I, I would snap the filibuster away uh, right now and uh, life would get a lot better for a lot, a lot of people. Yeah. Um, other than religion, uh, what would you say is maybe the biggest thing that you've changed your mind about uh, in uh, maybe in the last few years? Wow, that's tough. Um, I think that I've changed my mind about... Um, 
you know, I still listen to the same old 1970s music that I did when I was in college. I mean, there hasn't been a lot of dramatic change uh, other than, uh, you know, the aging process and, and what it's done to my ability to uh, play sports. So, no, <laughs> I, I, I have no dramatic change, Nick. I'm sorry. I, I guess I used to assume that that uh, this great bipartisan problem solving was always just around the corner. And uh, I am much less sanguine about that these days. I, I am much more resigned to the fact that our politics have hardened, uh, that elections are much more hardwired along party lines, and our, our windows of opportunity to collaborate across party lines are just very limited. Yeah. No, I, you know, I, I think that is an important thing to recognize. I, you know, one of the things that I think we as um, secularists and, and people who are responsive to reason uh have to acknowledge is that sometimes our, our, our views need to change depending on, you know, what, what we're seeing right in front of us. And I, I was kind of right there with you. I mean, I studied political science and um, kind of had that hope of that kind of institutionalist hope of things, uh, you know, the, the good old days, but it's, it's interesting reading books and, and looking at just the, what's right in front of your face to see that that may not be the case, how we assumed these things worked over time just may not be how it was. So, yeah. um, Speaking of books, uh, have you? What's a book that you've read recently that you would recommend our folks check out? Well, I'm just finishing up Malcolm Gladwell's "Talking to Strangers," uh, but before that, um, I read a fascinating book called *Sapiens*, and uh, the author's name is escaping me right now. But um, uh, the American Atheist Association members would love that book because it does a deep dive into um, our species and you know how we. Uh, we're so successful, how religion played a major role in that success. And, uh, uh, you know, a very uh, clinical and scientific analysis of, of how religion has shaped uh, for good and bad um, our uh, development as a species. Great. Who's your biggest political inspiration? Um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a Barack Obama guy. I just I love the story of Barack Obama uh, and uh, everything that he stands for. And, and, you know, he's a president that I actually got to know a little bit and, and spend some time with and just respect uh, the heck out of it. What's the biggest misconception that people have about what it's like to serve in Congress? The misconception. I, I, yeah, there's so many. <laughs> everything <laughs> from, uh, from the assumption that we have a gold plated uh, health plan, <laughs> which we don't, uh, to the assumption that all of our kids' student loans are forgiven and that we uh, uh, have all of these, these privileges and, and perks that, that don't actually exist. Uh, that's, that's part of it. Um, but I think there's also a, a lack of appreciation for how uh, hard it is to unplug. Uh, when you are a member of Congress, you are expected to be on pretty much all the time. And um, that is just, a, you know, sometimes a, a, a taxing aspect of the job. I, I would like to wear my flip-flops to the grocery store and not have to stop and talk tax policy with somebody in the checkout line, but um, it goes with the territory. It's part of public service and, and it's okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, what's the time that you've been starstruck meeting somebody, um, either as a, con as a member of Congress or just in general? I don't get starstruck. Uh, hmm. but if I were to get starstruck, um, it would probably be if I had the chance to hang out with James Taylor. James Taylor. Oh, that's, yeah. that's a, that's a good one. If you were to be starstruck, I think that's a good choice. Um, yeah. uh, popular question in our community that I, I I'm obligated to ask you is a hot dog a sandwich. Uh, I think Joey Chestnut might have uh, something to say about that. He would probably <laughs> argue, "No, it's it's a it's a sporting good." <laughs> yeah, if you can eat, if you can consume forty five of them in a, in what is it, ten minutes or whatever. I, yeah, it may not be a sandwich anymore. Um, all right, well, we've got some some good questions here uh, from folks in in our chat uh, that I'll kind of run through. Um, I, I, you know, one of the things that people often ask us uh, in our interactions with the Free Thought Caucus is, um, and and just based on demographics, um, do you, are there members of Congress who are hiding, uh, who are non-religious, um, that are kind of afraid to come out or afraid to to be honest about that, and and just haven't gotten there yet, um, and and have they come to you and spoken to you about that? And 
I, I won't ask oh, you yeah. to name names, obviously, but <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's an emphatic yes, there are, and and more than a few. Yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, I've had very candid conversations, and uh, it's not just members of the Free Thought Caucus. Uh, it, you know, you will find in the ranks of the Free Thought Caucus, you know, folks that are um, pr- pretty honest uh, about mm-hmm. their. Uh, lack of religiosity, um, but there's people who are afraid to join the Free Thought Caucus that are very um, uh, passionate atheists, yeah. but are afraid of the pol- the political backlash. So that's you know just the way it goes right now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what's it like working with other members of religious? minority groups. I, people mentioned, it, for example, working with representatives uh, Omar and uh, Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib, uh, Representative Tlaib is a member of the Free Thought Caucus. Um, what's that like? Uh, do you find a lot of common ground being sort of members of these other religious groups that maybe aren't encompassed in, you know, the Christian hegemony that goes on in Congress? Um, and how do you find common ground with people that don't share your religious views? Well, I think they naturally uh, would align with my work to um, oppose theocracy in this country and to to push back on you know the constant weaponization of Christian religion, which is kind of what it's been uh, lately. But uh, we we work together mainly because we're just fellow progressives. I, I don't think religion uh, has a lot to do with it. We we just have some common values. Yeah, and I think that's that's a crucial component of this that a lot of people don't get is that that if you start by talking about values and, and however that is expressed through religion is sort of a different conversation. But starting with values is a great way to find allies on any issue, whether it's, you know, transportation policy or whatever. Um, it's it's a way for us to get more engaged in our communities as well. You don't just say, well, I'm only going to work with, you know, people who sh- share the same religion as me. I'm going to find common ground on an issue that I care about that that expresses my values, um, and it's something we encourage people to do as well. Um, let's see here. Um, I, one question that a lot of folks have is, what can we as a secular community do to better understand the challenges that you as a legislator face, um, and how to best support the work that you do and the work that um, members of the Free Thought Caucus and, and anybody who supports our mm-hmm. issues? How do we how do we best support you? Well, you've been great with me. Uh, so I couldn't ask for more support. This community has just been fantastic. And I thank you very much for that. But a, a suggestion, uh, because I suspect uh, a lot of your membership is just from all over the country. You, you might think about taking a page from what Indivisible have has done. They have organized chapters in congressional districts and um, they ask for regular uh, you know, quarterly or bi-monthly or whatever meetings with their member of Congress. Mm-hmm. And you'd be surprised when uh, constituents actually just ask for a 20, 30 minute sit down with their member of Congress to talk about public policy um, and make their views known. Elected officials generally find a way to say yes to that. Yeah. So, you know, I, I have those meetings with Indivisible. And they're great meetings because I share a lot of values with Indivisible. We are mostly in full agreement on everything they want to talk to me about. But if there was a moderate or a conservative oriented group that was organized the same way and wanted to meet with me in good faith and have, you know, civil constructive conversations, I would do that too. Yeah. I think that's something that people, especially the folks who are in not in your district who are or not in districts uh, of, of members like yourself, um, you know, th- that we need to understand as well is that if we come to these meetings in good faith, um, you'd be surprised how often, I mean, you know, my, my mind has been changed on policy issues by talking with smart, good faith conservatives who have a different view on a particular topic than I previously did, who have fantastic ideas. And I think that if you um, are, are willing to put yourself out there a bit, Um, you'd be surprised how often you can find that common ground, especially when you start with um, a value and taking it back to that core value of, you know, what we're trying to communicate here and, um, you know, what's at the center of the policy prescription we're talking about, not just, hey, you should vote for this bill, but here's why. Uh, So, absolutely. Um, We've got a question uh, somebody mentioned, uh, wanted to go back to your your music preferences. Uh, Do you have a 
Led Zeppelin song that's in particular your jam? Yeah, Led Zeppelin was way too rock and roll for me. I, I'm like in the sappy, you know, folk rock uh, oh, okay. kind of Jackson Brownie uh, stuff. Jackson Brownie stuff. That's a <laughs> we're going we're to quote you on that. <laughs> uh, what advice would you give uh, to someone who is uh, a non-theist who is considering running for office, uh, in, especially in an area that leans conservative, um, you know, that isn't California's second yeah. congressional district. I, I think my advice would be to uh, certainly uh, not be dishonest or um, less than forthcoming about your uh, views, but be respectful of other religious views. I think in politics, uh, people are willing to accept the fact that their representative or a candidate that asks for their support doesn't share their religion. I, I think overwhelmingly people are good with that. Mm -hmm. uh, they're curious about uh, where your values come from and what they are and what your moral framework is. And I think you need to be able to articulate that. Um, and, and there's just so many universal values. You will find commonality with them and they'll be surprised to find it with you perhaps. But we should be respectful of uh, the fact that um, other people you know, who choose to be religious um, don't want to be judged about their religiosity or about their faith choices. And I don't want to judge them either. So uh, I just think be careful and respectful about that. Yeah. And I, I, you know, this is something that, again, in the last decade or so, we've really had a sea change in, in terms of the number of people who said they would be comfortable voting for, I think it's usually framed as, would you vote for a president who, you know, is one of these characteristics, whether, you know, woman, uh, gay, atheist, Muslim, whatever, um, that that number has increased slowly, but it's increased uh, for, for atheists. Um, but it's it's a little bit different, I think, when it's a when it's a local government official or it's your uh, your member of Congress. Um, the 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 barrier might even be a little bit lower, where people are willing to kind of hear you out because they have more direct access there. They can talk to you. I think that's an important thing for anybody who's considering running for for office to to recognize. Yeah, you're you're a little more humanized. You're not the, the you know some abstract label uh, that. Yeah. You know, and in, in the case of an atheist, that label for a lot of people it still has some baggage. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely something that we grapple with all the time um, and that we encourage people to use that label as a way of, uh, of reducing that baggage and reducing that stigma. Mm -hmm. So um, absolutely agree with you there. Um, one of the biggest state level things that we're seeing right now is this weaponization of religion, um, particularly against uh, trans people, um, particularly against LGBT people seeking health care. Um, and uh, against women uh, or anyone who needs reproductive health care. Is there anything that is happening at the federal level to undercut those or to, to reinforce and, and protect those rights federally so we don't have to worry about, you know, something that just like what happened in um, Arkansas or Montana or South Carolina or Georgia? Yeah. Um, the, the short answer is yes. Uh, there is going to be all kinds of legislation that will continue to pass out of the House. Um, I don't know if we're going to uh, be able to get around the filibuster and codify uh, enduring solutions to some of these things. Uh, but I think you'll also see in the appropriations process, which is a way we can kind of tinker with policy as we as we spend money. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, that is a way to get around the filibuster. And, and we will undo you know, some of these restrictive uh, conservative provisions over the years. Uh, that that have stoked those uh, you know culture war issues. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I've been ordered to ask you, uh, dogs or cats? What's your are you a dog cat, person? Cat well, person? Yeah, actually, that's a great. You did ask me um, if I'd changed my mind on anything over the years, and I was a dog person for many years, and now I have a cat. So I got I, a cat. I'm right there with you. I grew up with lots of dogs, and apartment living in New Jersey is not conducive to the types of dogs that I would have, that I normally grew up with. So this is an ongoing, yeah. I don't want to say battle <laughs> within the American atheist staff, uh, but conversation that we have and lots of uh, animal pictures that get shared through our staff channels uh, all the time. So, um, <laughs> uh, and I guess, you know, let's close with, um, we're getting coming up to our uh, 50 minute here. Um, let's just close with one, I think really core question about values. What do you think is a, a universal value that is that resonates with almost all Americans that, that we can find common ground on? 
Yeah, well, there's so many, actually. I think uh, justice, uh, truth, um, protection of nature and our environment, um, equality is, you know, probably one of the more core values of uh, that that are supposed to be uh, one of the one of the central values of this nation and, and our founding. Uh, so there, there's a lot of, of uh, I think, common universal value, um, universal values that that can stitch us together in a broad alliance that has nothing to do with religion. And I'm I'm always impressed by how many religious people of good faith and goodwill um, are happy to uh, ally themselves and work very closely with non-religious people, atheists, and others, um, just because of those universal values. Absolutely, and I think that's an awesome place to leave it. I'll I'll give you the last word if you have anything else that you'd like to mention or that you think our folks should uh, should get more information about when they leave here today. Uh, no, but thanks. Uh, that, that's really the big takeaway from me. Uh, this this secular coalition and the American Atheist Association in particular have just been great allies of mine, uh, supporting the work of the Free Thought Caucus. So please continue to support and uh, participate in these associations. I would say to all of your listeners right now, it matters. Uh, it really, really does. the The secular community is growing, uh, is becoming. Uh, quite a presence politically in this country. Uh, and as that continues to happen, I'm going to grow the ranks of the Free Thought Caucus, and we're going to start racking up some victories uh, legislatively and otherwise. So this this really does matter, and I'm glad you're doing it, and I'm honored to be with you today. Well, thank you again for for making the time this uh, uh, great Friday, we'll call it, uh, for for us <laughs> to, to be here. Um, we, we really appreciate all the work that you've done and, and you know, being a champion for our issues, um, even on, you know, uh, international issues and just issues all across the board. So thank you once again for, for making the time. Uh, and uh, we'll look forward to what comes next. Great. Thanks for having me, Nick. Thanks, Congressman.